Okay, thyroid. Thyroid is a very emotional topic in medicine. For some reason, this produces high emotions between medical colleagues and sometimes even medical boards. So, paradigm shifts. Lab tests lack sensitivity. TSH is not the most sensitive test. Normal TSH is getting lower all the time. What is a normal TSH? Is it 10? Is it 5? Is it 2.5? Is it 1.5? Since free T3 is the active thyroid hormone, this is the best clue to what's going on, but clinical correlation is required. Again, look at the patient. U thyroid is an optimal thyroid. You can't burn fat without, the T3, without T3 plugging into nuclear receptor for thermogenesis. So you need T3 for fat loss. T3 protects against arrhythmias. Wait a minute, did I get that right? I thought the first thing you do when you work up for atrial fib is look for hyperthyroidism. But yes, T3 protects against arrhythmias, I'll show you. T3 decreases, remember that evolutionary business with stress or dieting. That's the problem with yo-yo diet sometimes. Low T3, high reverse T3, it doesn't work. Again, T3 is the active hormone, T4 is a pro-hormone, and you don't necessarily convert T4 to T3. And then there's this stereoisomer reverse T3, which reverses the effects of T3. Replacing a combination of T3 and T4 gives you a better quality of life than just T4. Medical literature is very conclusive on that when you're talking about quality of life. Now, many factors decrease this conversion. Again, dieting, stress, deficiencies of zinc or selenium, and drugs, amiodarone. Any uh, emergency uh, docs here or former, uh, or trying to, yeah. That's a, that's a very big source of docs going into anti-aging medicine. Sometimes, I don't know what the percentage, that's huge. Um, amiodarone is the answer to every question on the ACLS test now. If you don't know the answer, probably a good, good choice. Um, anyway, it's a major player in altering thyroid status, usually producing hypothyroidism, but possibly hyper. Now, hypothyroidism is getting more common, or for some reason. In the 20s, Dr. Starr thought it was maybe 10%. In the uh, 40s, Broder Barnes, who came up with the axillary temperature test, thought it was 30%. And uh, Jacques Hertog, Thierry Hertog's father or grandfather in the 90s thought it was 80%. It's pretty common. And once you're really screening for symptoms and looking at lab tests. So why is this? Maybe we're recognizing it more, but maybe there's more hypothyroid. Maybe in the past, hypothyroid children didn't survive and pass on their genes. Now with better sanitation or antibiotics, so the hypothyroid children survive. So now there's hypothyroid adults walking around, and they may be attracted to a hypothyroid mate, same uh, lifestyle. Then they may reproduce, and you get more hypothyroidism. But there may be environmental toxins, heavy metals, other reasons, but it's lots of it. There can be different causes of hypothyroidism, failure of pituitary control, low TSH, secondary hypothyroidism. Failure of hypothalamic control, low thyroid releasing hormone, tertiary, these are rare. Thyroid failure, a primary hypothyroidism is the most common. Then you can have failure of conversion. Then you can have thyroid resistance or type 2 hypothyroidism. You know, when it's talked about in the medical literature, usually just talking about a few rare genetic uh, SNPs, but it's probably much more common than that, with, even without these um, mutations. So some people, the numbers look okay, but they're still hypothyroid and because of thyroid resistance, just like insulin resistance. Then you can have adrenal insufficiency. Lowered cortisol affects thyroid production, conversion of T4 to T3, and receptor uptake. So if you have adrenal insufficiency and inadequate cortisol, thyroid may not work. So you've got to think about this thyroid-adrenal connection. And there's different philosophies, whether these need to be done serially. I'm more of a parallel kind of guy in treating patients. I think I, you can do it all at once, as long as you know, you know what you're doing and look at each hormone and what the side effects are. But again, some like to do it one at a time. So you need to treat adrenal fatigue nutritionally or with actual bioidentical hydrocortisone, 
because low thyroid uh, outputs a stress situation. You can get increased cortisol as the response. This happens for a while, but then it, it, burn, it stops. The adrenals can no longer produce it. Especially when you only treat with T4 and you don't convert to T3, it can increase the stress situation. So we all know the most common symptoms. There's thousands of hypothyroid symptoms. Cold intolerance, just a handshake test, you know who's hypothyroid when you meet them right away. Fatigue and the dry skin and thin hair and constipation and can't lose weight. And there's, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of symptoms. You know, the weight gain, patients can't metabolize calories and they're too tired to exercise. It's interesting, there can be heat intolerance as well as cold intolerance. The typical fluid retention, the periorbital, ankle. Hypertension goes along with hypothyroidism. Depression, memory loss, anxiety, achiness, arthralgias coarseness. If you look at another tables of symptoms, you see this, this, they're so diffuse. Which symptoms are almost always present? Weakness, dry skin, coarse hair, lethargy, edema. But then you get from everything from chest pain, um, the palpitations, again hypothyroid to anorexia. So we've got a tyrosine ring and you put two of them together and you stick on some iodine molecules and you've got the different thyroid hormones. So the endogenous production Thyroxin equals T4, about 100 mics a day. T3, and there's lots of synonyms, triodothyronine, liothyronine, about 30 mics per day. You get that from small amount being produced by the thyroid gland, but most from deiodination, taking off one iodine molecule. Now, when we do our thyroid math, you have to realize that T3 is four times as strong. So we're going to take away some T4. We want to figure out how much T3 to put back. Keep that in mind. And there's some T1 and T2. So you can diagnose hypothyroidism by, well, the TSH is elevated, that's traditional, or the clinical symptoms, that's more useful. Again, if you're going to look at a number, free T3 below the optimal range. Very often, free T4 and TSH can be normal. But again, the hormone is free T3. And there's a continuum between euthyroid and hypothyroid. It's not one certain cutoff. And the distinction about TSH is arbitrary. But let's start with TSH, it's kind of indirect. Would you diagnose testosterone deficiency by looking at LH? Or would you look at the testosterone or the free testosterone? So it's left over from another generation. So what TSH is normal? In Americans without known thyroid disease, 1.5 average. Patients, um, what about patients who are TPO positive? maybe 13% of the whole population, maybe 20% of patients who show up at an anti-aging uh, clinic, maybe 25% of women who show up in an anti-aging uh, practice. People seem to be the happiest and best cognitive function, have the best lipids and the least adipose when the TSH is lower, is between 0.1 and 1. And keeping it in that range, and I'll show you the data to, to document this,